In today's discussion, we will explore the value of using stories in teaching the Introduction to American Government course. After hearing from Scott, we will move on to the Q&A, where he will answer questions that you have submitted. Without further ado, Scott Abernathy. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining the conversation today. I really appreciate it. So the, this webinar is designed and framed around using the power of stories in our teaching of American government and politics. Um, I'm guessing you know, many of you all will have some interest in and questions about taking the narrative approach in our classes and using stories to engage our students into meaningful conversations and to bring all of their diverse voices and perspectives into our explorations. I mean, teaching really is a form of storytelling. We, we all do it every day in the classroom. We use stories, examples from the news, from history, even from popular culture to enhance our discussion of ideas. Because we use stories so often in our teaching, we may not always be conscious of the power of the stories. And I do think there is something very powerful about using stories and narrative to teach the Intro to American Government course. So for the next few minutes, let me tell you why. Uh, today, I'll focus on three questions in turn. Why use stories? Uh, second, how does an instructor choose the right stories? And third, what are some practical tips that can lead to student success? So first, why use stories? But before digging into the power of narrative, um, perhaps we could do a quick poll, maybe coming back to this uh, in more detail in the Q&A. Um, so a, a quick question. Now think about a story that's particularly powerful to you. Uh, what makes it so memorable? Um, it, was it vivid characters? Uh, compelling plot, drama, and uncertainty, uh, all of the above, or, or other. So we'll wait for the results and then maybe chat a bit. Well, well while y'all are contemplating that, I mean, one point that I'll make in this, in this talk is that narrative and the power of stories is getting attention not, not just in political science, but in neurobiology and in economics, in fact. And more and more attention, I think, is being paid to what is it about stories that, that, helps, that helps us learn, um, uh, regardless of, of, um, of, of what part it is. Ah, okay, so I see characters are all of the above. Um, our, our main responses in, the, in this quick poll. And you know, for me, it, 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 many of these, you know, we, we all have our own, the own things that, that drive us. But again, the point is these aspects of narrative, not only are they compelling on their own, but they, they help anchor the material. Um, there's a growing body of research that points to the power of stories in helping students remember. We'll put up a few citations, I think. Don't feel like you have to take notes right now. Um, to help remember and learn the core content of a discipline. Uh, like I said, recent findings in neurobiology support what many of us instinctively know to be true, that we are wired to be storytellers and story hearers. Uh, we all use stories in our teaching to serve this purpose. Uh, we use stories um, to highlight an idea or facilitate a deeper understanding of, of the core content. Um, so maybe we'll hop on to the next slide. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, you know, facilitate, like I said, a deeper understanding, but, but how we use the stories is important. You know, on, on the one hand, you could lecture for 10 minutes about a key concept and, and then introduce the story as, like a, as a quick illustration of the concept, or you could introduce the idea through a story, using the narrative to hook the student in for genuine engagement with the material, get them really invested in the theories that try to explain political outcomes, and the enduring questions of American representative democracy. And also, students can connect the dots between those elements and gain a deeper understanding of complex issues without them seeming to be so complicated and scary and, and more accessible for the students. So here's an example. Right now, as you all know, Neil Gorsuch is undergoing the process of confirmation to the Supreme Court in a time of, to understate it, a profound political polarization. Uh, it, it's key that our students understand the role of the federal judiciary and especially the Supreme Court in American government, including an understanding of the Senate's role of advice and consent, Hamilton's Federalist 78, not the musical version, though it is excellent, and separation of powers in a constitutional republic. But understanding these concepts, especially in these times, such a charged environment, to me, is more deeply understood 
also through an exploration of the confirmation of Soto Sotomayor and the failed confirmation of Robert Bork. Now, while her confirmation was successful, Justice Sotomayor's critics pointed to uh, comments that she had made prior suggesting that her experience as a wise Latina might help her inform more just rulings on her part. Uh, on the other hand, Robert Bork's confirmation failed largely because his critics worried about a strict textual approach to do judicial decision making. So exploring these narratives helps students wrestle with the question of how political the court is, how different the least dangerous branch of the federal government is or, or should be. I mean, do Supreme Court nominees run for office in our current era? Should they? Uh, what would Hamilton have to say or sing or rap about the court in the 21st century? Um, so how do I choose the right stories? Well, there's so many possibilities that I'm not sure any one set is right and another wrong. Um, what, what guides my choices, though, are really two main objectives. Um, first, I try to choose a set of narratives that's truly inclusive of students' diverse lived experiences. And two, to help them gain the skills, confidence, thoughtfulness, you know, to successfully reflect upon key issues, hard issues often, that they're already wrestling with, with which they're already wrestling. Um, so to try to achieve the first goal, I try to use stories that, of, of those of like a vastly diverse group of Americans. Um, narrative can help students understand that American government and politics is about real people, their strategies, the actions they took, the contingencies surrounding those actions, and their outcomes, the struggles they faced. That uh, political outcomes are, are not predetermined, they don't fall out of the sky, but instead are the results of strategic choices made by political actors, usually undertaken in an uncertain environment and often amid uh, unequal relationships of power. Um, stories, to me, have the power to bring all voices into the conversations in ways that other approaches may not be able to, to do. Um, in, in this approach, diversity is not a list of boxes to be checked off. It, it fulfills a much deeper role. Um, the richness of Americans' experiences adds to a more robust understanding of the topics and concepts themselves. Um, so covering you know, the struggle of African Americans to achieve civil rights in a chapter on civil rights, for example, makes perfect sense. But it doesn't make sense that that would be the only place where we'd hear stories of other political actions taken by African Americans or others with similarly marginalized coverage in many, in many texts. And so the second goal is very much connected to that first goal, to help students gain the skills and confidence and thoughtfulness to, to reflect upon these key issues that they're already talking about and they're already thinking about. Um, after all, we're not introducing political issues to the students for the first time in the classroom. They've lived with the impact of so many political outcomes and actions, but through telling stories that highlight real people, you can provide a lens through which the students can recognize themselves in the political process. So perhaps maybe we'll do a second short poll. Um, have you experienced significant or increasing student diversity in your classrooms? Now obviously we've been teaching for different amounts of time. Some of us are new teachers. Some of us, like me, have been doing it for a fair bit of time but uh, maybe a useful question to, to reflect on as we go forward. I know here in, in Minnesota, for example, and like I said, I, you know, I've been teaching for, for a number of years, so I've been able to witness changes over time, but I've noticed um, a mar market increase in the diversity of students in my classrooms. I think you know, using stories and, and the diversity of our students not only is important on its own right, but it, like I said, I think it helps us um, it helps the students understand and, 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 and really dive deeply into deep concepts. So for example, when I cover public opinion, I frame the analysis around the shooting death of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, as well as the protests that followed. Uh, this helps accomplish several objectives. First, it's an issue that students are already confronting and one where I think you know, a balanced, thoughtful treatment can help them form their own ideas. Uh, and, and opinions. And narrative also allows for the inclusion of a broad vision of the diversity of Americans' lived experiences, including the reality that any one American may have multiple conceptions of their own identities and that, that those self-understandings shape their participation in the political process. Um, so through the power of narrative, my goal is that all students will find that they're also part of all this. They're part of the American experience you know, whether or not their voices have been heard. 
but the core content is there too when we use the events in Ferguson and following to explore questions you know, of stability and change in American public opinion. Is, is American public opinion meaningful? To what degree? You know, key questions that political scientists have been wrestling with. And so those narratives, I think, help make that material stick, stick better. So kind of connected to that, um, you know, third, what are some practical tips that can lead to student success with a storytelling approach? I have a few, um, and I'm very, very much would like to hear from all of you in you know ways in which that you found success, or maybe even things you know that didn't work out as planned. Um, we've all been there. I know I have. Uh, a, a lesson or activity that I just know will be spot on doesn't quite resonate, while another, out of the blue, sparks a great discussion. So one tip: guiding conversations. You know, I mean, here at Minnesota we tend to have very large introductory classes, uh, at least 80 students per section. And it can be intimidating for students to share their own thoughts, not because they're scared of me, I think, but perhaps more worried about sharing their own views you know, with a large group of, of peers. So to try to help break down those fears, we do a lot of small group work with three or four students in each. And the idea is to prompt them with one or two questions based on one of the stories have them discuss these questions with each other, and then ask for volunteers from the small groups. Um, so for example, I might, I might ask them, um, reflecting back on what you read about women in the United States Senate and the lack of descriptive representation of individuals with diverse lived experiences today, what does that mean for substantive representation? You know, can a senator or representative who does not reflect the lived experiences of many of his or her constituents truly represent them? So when volunteers from the groups share their thoughts with the whole class, we can then explore the complexity of the legislative process, seeing it not only as a vote on the House or Senate floor, but part of a long and complex process, one that was designed to make things not happen as much as it was to make things happen. That's where the ideas of descriptive and substantive representation really come into play for me. You know, perhaps a representative or senator who does not share the experiences of many of his or her constituents will necessarily attend to their concerns in a public and recorded vote on a bill. But there's so much more. You know, what about the less visible stages of the legislative process? You know, procedural votes, bill sponsorship, or being willing not to oppose a bill. That's where things get more complicated. And when we think about representation, where we may need to be more concerned with the makeup of, of Congress. And so you know, in these small groups, my goal is not to have them debate a particular policy or party platform, but to think carefully about what this thing called representative democracy is or is supposed to be. Um, a second tip that, that I find useful is telling stories with images. Um, you know, we all know that narratives are not only told through text. So one tool I, I use is to intentionally present students with narratives constructed through and around images you know, with the goal of helping foster image literacy. So for example, going back to the pet chapter on public opinion, um, I present students with two very different cover images and stories from the St. Louis Dispatch uh, on the one year anniversary of the shooting death of Mr. Brown. So if a photo, on the photo on the left, the photo of a peaceful protest was quickly replaced, that same space, that same uh, issue, with one of another shooting by a law enforcement officers that same evening. So you know, after reflecting on these images, I asked my students, you know, if you were an editor of the paper, how might you go about deciding which images to choose to convey the protests? Um, a third tool um, that I try to use it involves data literacy, which is uh, very important, especially in, in this day and age, um, and in, in especially in a data-driven world, is, is the ability to act as a critical interpreter of data, and, and maybe even more importantly, of the stories told based on sometimes competing interpretations of those data. I, that's, I think a fundamental skill is to, is to see the use of data and stories around data as an exercise of power. Um, so by exploring how individuals and groups have used data to frame or put forth a particular point of view, I think my students can better understand that data stories can be just as important in the political process as any other narrative and develop their own skills in data literacy. So one example that I use is to present students with some bar charts exploring the use of judicial review 
by justices' ideology in two separate courts, the Warren Court and the Hughes Court. Um, and importantly, to help students become more capable readers of data like bar charts and such, but also to help them uh, understand that judicial activism has not only been in the liberal direction in our nation's history, and again, to prompt students to think deeply about the role of justice's political ideologies you know, in, in this least dangerous, in this somewhat, somewhat different branch. So in, in conclusion, um, before we get to our questions, you know, our students are already having conversations about important and challenging issues. And I think that we tell and retell the difficult stories precisely because they're challenging. You know, helping us to figure out our places in what Walt Whitman called the powerful play, you know, in, in which each of us, whether or not we know it, may contribute a verse. And so I think that a balanced narrative approach can help guide our students through their own explorations. You know, my students do not generally want me to pit them against each other in, in a political debate. I think they get plenty of that in the media and social media. They want tools, you know, to help make their own voices stronger, more thoughtful, effective. And so narrative in all its forms, I believe, can do just that. Thanks, Scott. So um, I have a couple of questions. How do you go about deciding what stories to tell before each lecture? Yeah, it's a good question, Amy. Um, well, I, I really start from content and concepts. You know, what am I really, what am I trying to, to get across? Um, and, then, and then move from there. That, that's really the approach. So, you know, for much of the core material in my courses and, you know, many, many of the topics, I, I often tell my students, you know, there are more straightforward parts and more complicated ones. That, um, so, for example, the 14th Amendment guarantees equal protection of the laws. Uh, but what does that really mean? You know, how strongly should government act to protect them? How, how equal is equal? Um, so the stories of the you know, Southern resistance to Brown v. Board, and then the subsequent Supreme Court decisions, frustration really, and then an increasingly, an increasingly strong voiced court helps highlight that, that you know, civil rights are not binary things, that yes, we have them, but that, that, that to protect their expression, um, involves many, many choices, and choices by p many people, political actors, including the students themselves, honestly. You know, that, you know we, we call civil rights positive freedoms partly because they require positive action on the part of government you know, to protect them, but also because they require positive action on Americans to assert them. And so I think you know, when students can, can really you know, see themselves in the stories, it helps them understand, you know, it does, I, it doesn't, in the stories, they don't make students, you know, may necessarily, you know, I don't, I wouldn't take credit for helping them want to act, but perhaps it makes that the decision to act in the political space a little more concrete, um, a little more real, um, a little less scary, maybe. So for me, you know, storytelling is not about performance, you know, and I don't, I don't have to be Broadway ready, which is probably good for my students <laughs> that I don't, because um, I'm not. Um, <laughs> But, uh, which is too bad, that would be fun. But um, now, you know, now, now that, that I have the book, I, I do actually have a lot more flexibility, which, which I enjoy. So rather than, you know, retelling all the stories in the book, I can have, you know, students read before class and, you know, maybe with a short reading check at the start of class to motivate that act to read before class. Um, but then start with questions, you know, based on the narratives, you know, and so rather than retelling, just using them kind of as a jumping off point for discussions and questions. Um, so, for example, you know, after having read Campaigns and Elections, you know, the, a chapter that is very much focused on the growing Latino, Latina population, what's that, what is that going to mean for American democracy? I might ask, you know, so what is the congressional campaign of Salud Carbajal? Tell us about about this effect, about what, what effects this may or may not have on, on American politics going forward. But I can also use that story to say, you know, what it will ask, or, you know, what does it tell us about first timers running for Congress, you know, um, and the strategies behind their decisions to run that get us into the incumbency advantage, you know, and, and why challengers to incumbents are often not strong challengers and why first timers wait, you know, and Carbajal's, uh, that, that election was an open seat election. Most caps had, had retired. And so it, 
not only, you know, do we have these sort of broad societal issues that we can kind of think on, you know, and, 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 and contemplate, but it gets us also back to the to, to you know the the material that we expect to have in an intro textbook, you know, like incumbency advantage and the electoral connection and and all of those all of those things. Right, right, yeah, perfect. So, what about balance? Like, how do you decide when to tell a historical story in class versus one that is focused more on current events? Like, how much do you try to balance the two over the course of a semester? Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, for me, it's really a combination, Amy. Um, you know, uh, of course, our students are more interested in ripped from the headline material, and rightly so. It's, you know, it's what surrounds them in, in media and social media. But I also think that historical stories also included can provide um, some context for understanding some of these current issues. Um, so, for example, Edward Snowden, you know, just played most excellently by Joseph Gordon-Levitt in the movie. I encourage people to watch it. It's quite, it's quite good. Uh, but if Edward Snowden you know, returns to the United States, he'll, he will likely be tried under the Espionage Act, the same law that a gentleman named Benjamin Gitlow was a century ago. Um, you know, so diving at, you know, going through Snowden and exploring you know the the controversies and tensions because you know the, uh, of the decision to release that the, that those data and information, but diving back to what to Benjamin Gitlow's story, um, well, it also allows us to understand the process of selective incorporation because it's you know early stages of it um, of the Bill of Rights. But more deeply, it helps students you know understand that this this long-standing tension and it, uh, between freedom of expression and national security, it, it's not new. It's got new aspects and new technologies create new questions for it. But it's, it's just as critical now as it was you know, during World War I. And, this, and, and so, you know, the, the including some of that historical material, I think it, it, it helps, like I said, maybe, maybe add some context to, to that and also reinforce Again, key concepts like incorporation. Yep, yep. Perfect sense. So you've just written a textbook. And generally, part of a, the decision to write a textbook is the realization that no one book fits all of your teaching needs. Um, you've talked about wanting to give voice to Americans' lived experiences as a motivation for your storytelling approach. But what else was missing from the books on the market that you wanted to remedy? What stories were not being told? Yeah, um, I, uh, partly I think, you know, I, I felt that my students weren't really engaging with the text that I was using. Not, I mean, not that the texts were not high quality and, and, and you know, um, you know sub substantively um, excellent, but I, they, I just, they just weren't really engaging, I thought. Um, uh, it, oftentimes it, it seemed that they would, you know, skim for... The material that they thought would be on the test, and, and you know, sort of, and, and just and take notes, which is important and fine, but I don't, I, I, I again, I, it, it, doing that, I don't think they get in again to some of these kind of, you know, deeper tensions and questions that that they, the, you know, that the course can really help them um, wrestle with, you know, and and, and explore. Um, you know, another example, right, is um, in a again from you know the, the Bill of Rights that uh, religious you know protection of religious expression you know I'll, I'll tell my students you know there again there are straightforward examples and you know there are more complicated ones that um, so obviously you know a, a person's right to practice their faith in their own home is protected under the under the Bill of Rights and and pretty you know legally straightforward but 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 there are more complicated parts of that I think like so for example what about a parent's you know decision to deny medical care to their child based on their religious beliefs you know uh, is that part of the First Amendment or protected in the First Amendment and and how do we decide that you know and, and obviously you know Supreme Court and such but but deeply how do we as Americans wrestle with those sort of deeper issues so I think if they just if they're just skimming um, um, through the material and, and, and you know, for for tests, they, they they miss the opportunity, you know, that, because they're going to be dealing with these these issues. They are, and they're going to continue to be once they're you know post post graduates. So I think I think narrative can help do that. So that's part of it. Uh, also, 
I, you know, I wanted a book that was uh, flexible, uh, one that I could tailor to my own approach, you know, because we all have our own approaches. Some, some of us may focus on uh, um, institutions. Uh, for example, um, you know, institutional approach. Others may focus on political behavior, and I, either are fine and valid, or some might, you know, some of us might do a combination of both. And um, I, I find that narrative, it, it, that the flexibility, it allows us, you know, as instructors to to go down the you know sort of theoretical approach that that we find is most useful for us and, and for our students. And so I, that that was also part of it, Amy. I think. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, um, let's take a few questions from people who are attending today. Uh, the first question we have is, um, hold on, I've got to just go find it. Um, have the stories used in your textbook been tested and used in the classroom? And if so, have you noticed an increase in students' interest and in grades with this approach? Yeah. Um, I, I, yes, they have I, I, quite a bit. I think in the production of, of this of this book, I, I you know I'm, I'm not done you know sort of a formal statistical test just because I don't have for my own classes because I don't have a control because this is the way I teach right. <laughs> um, so I, so I lack a control group, Amy, on this. No, but it's it's an excellent question. Uh, I, I know it has, and I know the feedback that that I'm getting and that, that we're getting from uh, people who are actually using the book. This this uh, um, this this semester um, has has pointed to that they are actually reading the book, um, which I know it sounds obvious, but but I think that's you know that's an important step, a first step, and and and, and we really really haven't I haven't talked about it much, but that is a very much a goal. of This book is just that the students will want to read it, and um, and 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 not be a chore for them yeah. because I think when they're you know when they're when when they're in that kind of space, you know, where oh, I want to, okay, well, what's going to happen next? Or and like, you know, and like, you know, one of our the poll results. Well, who's this person? What, what, what was motivating them? You know, why did they? Why did this person decide to do that? Then, um, I, I think um, that, that that kind of stuff, you know, it, it really, you know, it brings them in. It brings them into into the book. And so, yeah, we're definitely seeing that that that. Um, the, the students are engaging, and and you know, the, the core stuff is it's all there. I mean, it, it's a pretty compre you know comprehensive in terms of, of the core content. But you know, it, it, again, it, it, you know, uh, you know, ten years from now, I don't expect my students to you know be able necessarily to list all of the cases involved in, like I was talking about, selective incorporation. Yeah, I have my own personal favorites. I think um, they do change though, that because you know the. Well, <laughs> This past year, there have been plenty of things to talk about. That's for sure. Um, that, um, that that the students and I, this isn't a, a big story, but it's one of my favorites, and and it's 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 one that I've really only been using, I guess, for this semester and last. So bear with me, panelists, because I am going somewhere. I promise. Um, but it's a little mini narrative, I guess, right? Because there's mini narrative you know, in the in the book too. But so there's a, a science fiction movie from the 1950s. Um, black and white called Attack of the Crab Monsters, and trust me, I'm going somewhere with this. My student, when I, and that's, I like that about stories that seem really random at first, you know, because the students are like, what is he talking about? Because that's, again, that's engagement, right? If, if they're kind of wondering, like, has Scott really gone off the rails once <laughs> and for all, you know, right. then, then, they're, then they're engaged, right? They're okay. So anyhow, um, so this movie, Attack of the Crab Monsters, 1950s, well, in the movie, um, these giant mutant crabs on this island. It's a tropical island with giant mutant crabs, like really big giant crabs. I think it was radiation, atomic testing, I think. I can't, you know, it's been a while since I've seen the movie, but I think it was atomic testing. But anyhow, these giant crabs evolve, and they eat people. And once they, and the, the scientists, there's a team of scientists on this island, right? And so they start eating the scientists. We don't really see that. In the 1950s, it wasn't quite as graphic as movies are today. But they eat the scientists, and then they absorb their personalities and voices, right, with the goal of luring other poor, unsuspecting scientists uh, to their doom, right? And, and so what, what, what is it about that little story? Well, in, in, in many ways, right now, and not just now, but especially now, that's, you know, that's the challenge that political parties face. You know, both parties uh, um, to, to different degrees is how do you deal with insurgents, right? Do you eat them, 
right? Do you absorb them <laughs> into, into, into your own party, you know, their views? Um, or do you stomp on them, you know, and try to silence those voices once and for all? And I mean, that's, and that's an issue. I mean, that, that right now, Congress is dealing, like, literally right now, right, with, with, with the, the Republicans and, and, and the, the failed uh, repeal of Obamacare. You know, what are the Republicans going to do? And I'm just, again, you know, this applies to Democrats, but right now in Congress, obviously, you know, Republican controlled, what are they going to do? Um, they, they're going to have to do something, you know, um, or fail. And so these, you know, these kind of sometimes mini random stories like giant mutant crabs, uh, it, 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 it gets the students, again, it's like, what on earth is he talking about? But that's, that, that, I, that can be, a, you know, sort of engaging kind of drama thing, too. So that's, yeah. that's one of my current faves. Mm -hmm. I love it. That's great. Um, I'm sure they are thinking what has happened to Professor Abernathy, <laughs> but you bring them around. Um, okay, we have another question. Um, politicians actively use storytelling. Candidates frame their personal stories or use narratives about real people yeah. on the campaign trail, for instance. Um, how does this form of storytelling relate to the ways you use storytelling in your course? Yeah, right. No, that's a good one. Um... Well, I think maybe I guess my answer would would be that having you know spent so much time with narrative as a tool in our courses, and you know you know oral, textual, current, historical, image, data, you know all that, all that stuff. Um, I think it I think it helps students realize sort of what the candidates and the politicians are doing you know that those are in, that's an intentional use of narrative for a political purpose for power right and mm -hmm. so the uh, you know I, I think it, it, it my, I guess my answer it's more that then the students can be more critical receivers of those stories because they, they have a, a better sense of, of, of that this you know that that's that's what they're that's what they're doing. So let me, you know, I'm, as a student, I'm pretending I'm a student. So let me just kind of step back and say, all right, what 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 are they doing with this story? What what you know? What are they expecting me to accept? You know, what what assumptions? You know, talk talk a lot about that. That, you know, what what are the built-in assumptions that I'm supposed to be accepting? That maybe I want to think on a little more deeply, and maybe I don't want to accept those assumptions. So, you know, I I think that. And like I said, having kind of thought of it as a tool that that they, that they can better handle that and, and better and more usefully receive those stories critically. I think. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, so here's another one. Um, you talked about your criteria for telling a good story in class, but where do you go to look for the stories? Like, where does the inspiration for the stories come from? Oh, that's a good one. Um. Yeah, everywhere, pretty much. Um, yeah. Um, well, again, you know, like I said, I I, I do. I, I want to start from content, right? So, uh, and and not and which includes, you know, several things, right? So, yes. What are you know the absolute core content that we need in this chapter? Right, because this is yeah. an intro American government class. The students are going to go on to hopefully to take more political science courses. So one, I want that, you know. That, yep. So so that's a right, and yep. then, um, but then also, okay. But but what what are the really you know sort of the deeper things that may seem complex to students? You know, deep. You know, I've talked you know at length today about some, but but yeah, those those deeper um, questionings. You know, the sort of that 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 I, that I want them to be able to help give them, you know, some you know help navigate. I mean, you know, I I really. I mean, tour guide isn't quite the right word, but it's partly kind of how I feel. You know that that, that you know I, I I do want to act as as sort of a guide through American politics without you know you know forcing an opinion on students, but but like oh okay on your left is federalism. All right, now what are some you know now we got to what, what, what you know what are some really important questions about federalism, right? And and so. So, for example, right, so let me, I think on that, you know, well, it's unresolved, right, that it's sort of an evolving and um, dynamic thing. Right. Um, okay, so I got that, B, right, and so now what, you know. Um, then, so I've got, you know, core stuff about, you know, you know um, dual federalism, cooperative federalism, you know, all those important things, but then I also have this, 
you know, sort of deeper thing about, you know, that I want students to understand how it's evolving, um, um, how it's dynamic and c complex and contested, right? So, okay, so I want to do that. And then find some story. No, but, but that leads to naturally, you know, so what, what's an example of an, an issue or examples of an issue today that students are, are going to have been thinking about that really gets to the heart of that? Well, how about legalization of marijuana? Right? That, and again, not debating pros and cons. I just don't do that. I don't want to do that in my book to tell students hey, it's good, but but, but to, to to say, well, what is, what is it about recreational and medicinal marijuana that that can you know teach us more about federalism? Well, that's a good one for that because right now you know we have. You know, more than half the states have legalized medicinal marijuana, and an increasing number, what most recently California, right, um, have legalized recreational marijuana, right, um, and so that's legal under those states. But that uh, that use is still illegal under federal law, the Controlled Substances Act, and marijuana is, you know, it's classified as a Schedule One substance, the most dangerous with no medical uses, and so. Again, you know that that's got to get resolved somehow. That 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 you know that something's going to happen with that. I don't you know don't predict what or something. And so there's it was actually a really you know a powerful case um, that and it's a Supreme Court case, right? Uh, Gonzalez v. Reich. That you know, two women who were this was medicinal who were using medicinal marijuana had you know uh, the sheriffs. And DEA agents came to the one of the, to their home because they were growing under the laws. Um, the sheriffs went away because they were oh. they were complying with uh, state law. But the DEA agents seized the plants, and this was very upsetting for these two women because they were they were gravely ill. Um, and so, but and so, you know, that's it's 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 you know a personally compelling story. But it also that case goes to the Supreme Court, and in it, and it's still you know the the ruling of the land. The Supreme Court said, you know, that, that, com that the Commerce Clause says federal government has that power. And so, again, we, you know, we get like, another deep question, um, marriage equality, right? Uh, that, I mean, that's an important question of civil liberties, right? But it's also a federalism question, really, you know, and, and we get – and so the two, the two, the two DOMA cases, uh, Windsor and then Obergefell, um, uh, sadly enough uh, – um, arose from similar circumstances that the, the death of a same-sex spouse. Um, in, you know, in, in, again, different contexts in terms of DOMA, but you know, those are powerful and, and, and compelling stories of, of the individuals and, and uh, of the surviving spouses and, and their use of the courts, right, to to make change. Um, but again, it you know it gets back to full faith and credit, right? Do, you know, should do state well then they do now because of the Obergefell case. Um, and I love that one quote from from James Obergefell. His you know his his husband had uh, they uh, passed away. Um, well, they, and they weren't. They were in Ohio, and Ohio didn't recognize marriage equality, so they they flew to Maryland, got married on the tarmac, uh, Baltimore Airport, uh, which did recognize same sex marriage, and then flew back to Ohio. Mr. Obergefell's spouse sadly passed away from Lou Gehrig's disease, um, and so he sued Ms., uh, James Obergefell. But just uh, you know, on a lighter note, one, uh, one, a quote you know, the Obergefell says. I'm, you know, he talks about his seriousness and how angry he was. You know that that that, that this wasn't being reckoned. But then, then he said, "I can't wait to have how many law students are going to have to learn how to pronounce a Burgerfell." So, I, you know, it <laughs> brings sort of humanity. Anyhow, so yeah, yeah, we'll get on to other questions. But thanks. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, here's one: How often do students introduce their own stories into the classroom, and is there value, or or what is the value of bringing student stories into the discussion? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a good one. Um, well, I, I probably, you know, for those of you that have smaller classes than I do here at Minnesota, you probably get more of that than I do. You know, it's a big class, and they are, um, they are, uh, um, uh, you know, a, a little more reluctant. But, but they do, and 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 sometimes, um, not just sometimes, and, and when they do, it can be really powerful. Um, like I said, it can be intimidating for the students, and and but skillfully, you know, handled. Uh, so, uh, like for example, I had a, a student in my intro classes a couple of years ago, African American student uh, who was blind, 
Um, and um, he in, introduced, he sort of talked in, in class about some of his own experience. But then he goes on, and I did not know this at, at the time. And then, but then he goes on, because we, this was during this, we're talking civil rights, um, and we were we were talking about you know the NAACP's. It was a strategic decision, you know, to use the courts to pursue the legal strategy. That was not just, that was not you know uniformly thought of, even pursuing integration was not uniformly thought of as um, the goal, right? There were many voices that, that were arguing for, let's build up economic power in our communities, and, and then we'll, we'll, we'll try to make change. But anyhow, he you know, told his, his own personal story, and that, but then he goes on and say, and one of the leading activists in the early 20th century in the NAACP was blind, and used that experience to, to inform his, his efforts. Know, to to make social change, so hmm. I just, that, that, yeah, that was that, so. I, I just thought that was that was very powerful. Sometimes they'll tell me their own story, you know, in like office hours and things. Especially, I think you sort of you know some of them more personal, and and then again can help guide them, you know, to okay, well, you know, how how does that inform, you know, you as a scholar, you know, so bring it back to the sort of the scholarship and 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 help you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and do they come to you in the when they come to you during your office hours? Are they looking for direction? I mean, are they turning to you for that kind of help? Sometimes, sure. You know, as always, that um, you know, obviously, you know, help with content and and, and material. Um, but as, as often as not, they 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 just they just want to talk, you know, and, yeah. and interested. And that, those are the those are the the, the most you know, rewarding, you know, where they just like. You know, so we were reading about this, Scott or Professor Abernathy, you know, whatever they choose to call me. Oh, you know, we're reading about this, but hey, what about you know, and bring up something. You know, I was, you know, I was at a rally the other day, and and I noticed this. So how does that relate? And let's talk, you know, or or you know, that reminds me, you know, I saw on the news, you know, this this thing, and so how does that connect? And so that happens as often as as I think any other um, kind of interaction. And and again. So we're not, you know, maybe explicitly like going over, you know, like you know, here's multiple cho choice code, but 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 it is reinforcing the content. And and like I said, I often as often as not, I end up learning stuff from that because obviously, you know, there's just so much only one person can know, and so their 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 stories help me learn and 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 grow as a teacher and a student, frankly, to be to be yeah. honest. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. Uh, we have a question about what you expect from students. So do you always expect student interaction every time you tell a story? Um, and what are, and sort of what, in what ways do you expect your students to participate when you're, you're telling a story? Yeah, I think it depends, Amy. I think, um, you know, it, it depends on, you know, the, what we're talking about and, and the story itself. Um, you know, sometimes they'll just, you know, just, that they're hopefully you know wrapped in the story, you know, um, and I think often that happens when we're talking about material that you know that maybe not current, you mm -hmm. know, and 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 so I, I probably get more of sort of the listening for that kind of stuff. So, yeah. like for example, you know, Marbury v. Madison. I mean, it may sound really dry, you know, John Marshall issues, you know, then. Um, you know, the, the, I mean, the dry part, right, is that clause of the Federal Judiciary Act of 1789 is null and void because, you you know, Congress cannot give the Supreme Court the power of original jurisdiction over, you know, these public officials, right? So, but it really, it's a, it's a great story. Um, and, it, and it actually is, is current in so many ways because, you know, I mean, and, and again, you know, it trying to, Trying to to drive home or you know really think about this question of you know how different is the judiciary, especially you know getting back to to Federalist seventy eight, how political is the court and how powerful? And those those two things are both related. And those, that's what you know Hamilton was talking about. Is like, well, he was, you know, Hamilton said it's weak and it's not political, and so we can say, well, you know, is it really? And and, and even you know this, you know even Marbury v. Madison eighteen oh three, the court was acting politically. It had to. John Marshall had to because of the political context of the time. You know, and so, you know, you know we've we've undergone in you know twenty sixteen what most people regard as a rather harsh election. 
I'm not sure it was the harshest or the most divisive in America. I mean, 1800 was pretty divisive. Uh, they, then there was talk that you know, once the Congress finally, uh, the House finally, uh, you know, approved Jefferson for, or voted for Jefferson's was like the 36th ballot or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. There was talk of secession or I mean, civil war. I mean, so it, it was it was a very divisive election. So stories like that, I think, when sort of like go back in time, I, you know, oftentimes they I, I, you know they will kind of listen and, because it, it, it's different, but. When we're talking, you know, stories from current times, on the other hand, uh, it tends to be, you know, much more back and forth. And again, it depends on the, you know, the sort of the structure. I think that, you know, it, it, obviously they'll listen more when there's, you know, 85 of them in a in a classroom, but when, you know, we break them out into smaller groups, they'll, you know, interact more. But I do, I think it's it's the current stuff that. Um, that they, you know, really, you know, are getting into. So, you know, for example, you know, when we talk about, you know, the campaign, campaign of Bernie Sanders, you know, which I cover in a fair bit um, in in the book and, and in class. Obviously, this, the, you know, the students have much more to, to say on that, and 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 will will join in uh, to to and, and and share their own thoughts on those. So, I I think I don't want to make it too, you know, too dichotomous kind of answer to that, Amy, but. I, I think it, you, the historical stuff they do kind of just tend to listen to, to, to those, and because some of them are just powerful political yeah. stories, you know. Yeah. Um, but then, the, like I said, the more current, the where they feel, I think they have more more grounding. You yeah. know, before we introduce the material, if they have more grounding on all of it after, but um, then I think they're more likely that they'll that they'll they'll tend to jump in. Yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense. So um, we have another question. How do you help connect the stories back to sort of the nuts and bolts content? Like mm -hmm. I, this, this person says, I love engaging students with critical thinking, but I'd love to hear more about how stories help students retain the ideas and the concepts. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good that's a good question. I do it consciously and intentionally, um, uh, you know, sort of stepping in and out. So let's stay, let's step out, you know, and and step back and do this in the book too, consciously. Then okay, so, well, what do we get from that, you know? And and what you know, what what specific concepts? Well, quite a bit actually, right? I mean, not just Federalist seventy eight, but um, you know, this uh, judicial review, a deep understanding, and and then we can I can say, all right, so knowing you know that that some that you know that that the court often operates you know in a in a political environment like it did then, like it does now. Let's pause and, and think about these concepts of judicial restraint and judicial activism, you know, in in in, in constitutional interpretation, and um, you know, how does politics figure into that? So it's, it's kind of a conscious, yeah, stepping out, stepping out in and out of the stories as, mm -hmm. as needed. But but I, I do I do want to, sh you know, explicitly tell the students, you know, here's what we're doing now, right? We're now going to think on that story to learn about this. So that they, you know, to help them make those connections too. And I, I, I try to do it in the book too. I think, pretty, yeah. you know, hopefully. Yep. Um, I have sort of a practical question here. Um, how much time do you typically invest in researching and outline a story that you tell in class, like to make sure that it that it's got all the stuff so that you can do the, you know, that it has the ped the pedagogy yeah. and and uh, the power to relay the concepts you're trying to get to. Uh, sometimes too much, Amy. If I, if I get into a story, <laughs> and I, there are, you know, there are. Um, I'm, you know, looking over at my bookshelf now. I've got binders and binders of of stuff I wrote and stories that I didn't tell in the book. That just because I just <laughs> got so into them, you know. And I, you yeah. know, because I have my own. You know, I'm. I, I've just. I've through this process, I just got so into the the time of the New Deal and the Great Depression. Um, mm -hmm. Just uh, maybe partly because it's personal, and getting this, and some of the, and that's why, you know, the that's why I want a diversity of stories in the book because I think when when there's some connection and that's personal, it it just it makes it stick. And so for me, what it was is that my grandfather. Um, um, who has passed away? My grandfather. He rode the rails during the Great Depression, looking for work, um, um, and you know, so as I started to to you know sort of learn about the time of the Depression and then the New Deal that followed, um, I just I just became fascinated with it. So that's when I do too much on it and, and don't <laughs> include it. Um, but yeah, it it, re it really it really varies. Um, I, you know, you, you don't want to you know go going too long, right? Too much and, and lose the students. It's it, it's 
and there's no perfect, you know, there's no perfect answer. I don't, I don't, you know, have a perfect way that I do it. It's just, okay, have I covered what I want to cover? Yep. Um, have I given them, you know, a chance to really engage with, you know, sort of this deeper stuff, right? Because that's what I really, that's what they, that's what's going to, they're going to retain, you know, is, right. is the deeper stuff. I mean, years from now, you know, on right. down the road. And, and also, you know, do I have a story that, that isn't trying to lead them one way or the other? I don't want stories like that. You know, and, right. and I don't want stories that, you know, will force students into an uncomfortable debate that they don't want to have, you know, yep. um, because I, I, that, that's, that's just not, doesn't, that doesn't work for me. So that's part of the telling. This, this isn't quite an answer to that question, but I think it's related, so it's probably worth, worth commenting on, that really, you know, I, I said I sort of step out and say, okay, what did we learn? But I also step out and say, look, you know, we're not. I'm not going to use this story, you know, to 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 start a debate on topic X. You know, um, mm -hmm. the, but and I'll often, I'll say, you know, but that's those are important. Like so, marriage equality, right? You know, or 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 abortion, things like that. But I will say, you know, those are important topics, and and you should, you know, be forming your opinions on them. But we're not going to use the story to do that. Mm -hmm. What we're going to use it to do is, you know, to to reflect on you know, sort of the you know, different perspectives and how that connects to what we're trying to understand is how this giant thing called American representative democracy, you know, works, doesn't work, you know, or is supposed to work. And so I will consciously, so I choose stories that allow me to do that, right? It, it's, uh -huh. And it's not, it's not just, you know, because I, 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 there, there are stories I consciously don't use because I, I, you know, think well, that just might head us down, you know, a place where and that where the students, you know, feel like they they um, are placed in a spot that where they don't where they don't. Um, yeah. 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 And sometimes I just pick stories because I like them. Yeah. You know, I mean, I figure, it, you know, if if I find this story interesting, then hopefully they will too. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Well, we're we're we, I think we have time for just one more question and. Um, that question is: Were you always a good storyteller, or did you have to practice? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not sure I am, but. Um, oh, you are. Trust me. <laughs> um, well, I, I'm from Texas, and so you know, I, I could talk all day, Amy. Um, I don't. Yeah, you know, again, but I, 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 I don't feel like I need to be, yeah, like I said, a performance and and, and Broadway and and that sort of thing. And so I think I think we just you know rely back on you know, on questions, right? So what 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 is this you know conversation you know with students? And and so I think that's part of storytelling. I think that that instructors are, are often more comfortable with you know. So all right, well, you know what what do we what would what did, what did we get from that? You know. And so you know you read yeah. this. Um, you read about the, you know this story, and so you know what what what, what, do, what do we take away from it? And so I think that's a, that's a, that's an important part of storytelling. So you know we don't we don't have to you know feel like we're on the stage all the time because there's days right. where we just don't want to be, you know. Right. Um, um, and so I think it, it's important you know, that you don't have to do that. That 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 you know the, the students they're going to read the stuff, and then so hopefully we can just it's like okay, let's jump off from that and let's uh, let's think on this for a bit. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, I see that we are very close to out of time. So, um, any last words? Um, well, you know, I think it kind of connects with the the last question you know, that 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 was asked, Amy, which was a, a good one. You know, I'm, my course, you know, it's very much a work in progress. You know, as I, as I think it should be, and it's sometimes messy. You know, and that's good. You know, and so. I, I think you know it's just it's important for for me and for you know just to to remind ourselves occasionally that that's okay that's how it's supposed to be because American democracy is messy, it was designed that way and it's and it still is so I think that's sort of you know a, a, a final thing I remind myself um, of and and well and also uh, thank you all uh, for contributing your thoughts and questions uh, to the conversations today I re I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, uh, thank you everyone for joining us for today's Sage Talk. Um, please be on the lookout for an email that includes a link to view this entire webinar on our website, as well as some answers to some of the questions we did not have time to get to today. Scott has very graciously agreed to answer any questions we didn't get to. Um, and thanks for your attention. We hope you'll join us for another Sage Talk webinar again very soon. You can visit SagePub dot com slash sage talks for more information. Have a wonderful day and thank you Scott.